with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness didn't comprehend it. Then came a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own didn't receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. <coughs> Thank you. Let's just pray. Lord, we ask that as we uh, look into your word, that you would help us to see things from your point of view. For Jesus' sake, Amen. I'm going to be talking about a way of seeing. Good. And uh, going to ask Val to put up our first, our second uh, slide, please. Just have a look at that. It's rather amazing. We lived in Cyprus a number of years and we would buy buns that had that kind of design on the top. But this design has, is found underwater. <coughs> And uh, underwater divers off the coast of Japan um, saw that and they wondered, how did it get there? There's been an artist who has designed uh, that uh, beautiful work there. Uh, and it took them 10 years before they discovered exactly what did it. Would you like to show us the next slide, please, Val? Yes. It's a tiny little puffer fish. And uh, it's an amazing little fish. In 1995, the divers off the coast of Japan discovered the circular structure. It's, it was two metres or six feet in diameter. They knew it was the work of an underwater artist who remained a mystery. But now they know it's the work of this diminutive male, uh, puffer fish. It's only 5 inches or 12 centimetres long, centimetres long. It takes 7 to 9 days to complete. Apparently for 3 days, 3 24 hour days, the puffer fish doesn't stop. It's just building, 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 finding the tiny bits of shells. And it works for three days non-stop because of the currents. It doesn't want the currents to destroy it. And his goal is to attract a mate. He decorates it with broken pieces of shell. He stirs up the centre of it to attract her attention. She lays her eggs in the centre and he covers them. So I thought that was amazing. And this morning, we're looking at the way of looking at things. Ah, where did we go? Get my notes here. Now we've got another slide. And this is what that butterfly says. That's an old photo. <laughs> of course, the policeman is looking at a caterpillar. <laughs> It's, it's the way we see things, isn't it? The way we look at things. But obviously the caterpillar was on his license. <laughs> so, 
we're going to be just briefly looking at the way we see creation. Now, I've just shown you a, a little spe spectacular aspect of God's creation. Looking at creation, looking at ourselves, looking at the past, and looking to the future, and looking at all things. Genesis 1.1 says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So just looking at that image underwater, you know that it was created. You know that the currents just didn't create that. Amazingly, it was a tiny little fish. But the next amazing thing is that in that fish, in that tiny brain, which would be the size smaller than a pea that we eat, are programs that God, like computer programs, that God, the great mathematician, has put in that fish. Because that design under the, under the uh, water was perfectly symmetrical. <clears throat> Just like uh, webs of spiders and so many other things. The very fact that we all have our own fingerprints is amazing. It means that we didn't come from the same mould. If we did, we'd have the same fingerprints. Uh, in our cells, we're all made up of cells, there's our DNA, which is like a little string of beads, and we all have a different sequence in those string of beads, which is amazing, which indicates that we have been created, we have been designed. The Apostle John says of Jesus, John just read this morning, all things came into being by him and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. I want to look at now <clears throat> at ourselves or looking at or examining ourselves. There are two texts in the Bible that speak of self-examination. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, we read, Examine yourselves, whether you are in the faith. This was an exhortation to the Corinthians who were sadly backsliding and um, they needed to examine themselves to see whether they were really following the Lord or not. The other passage that I want to mention is, from, um, from Corinthians, and it's this one. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man and a woman examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. You know, this is not only referring to communion, but it's partaking of the Lord, but partaking of him worthily and not unworthily, saying we're a Christian and not living the life. Sometimes self and not Christ has come to fill our whole horizon. And when that happens, that's when we live a wonky lifestyle. The most relevant question is, am I a child of the Lord Jesus Christ? God's way of putting people right with himself has been relieved, revealed by the free gift of God's grace. All are put right with him through Jesus Christ. When Christ died on the cross, he died to take away our sin and our guilt so that we can have a relationship with him. And when we have that relationship, we are to walk by faith. A. Paget Wilkes was a missionary in Japan for many years, and he described faith as like this, forsaking all, I take him. F-A-I-T-H. Forsaking all, I take him. Forsaking all my independence from God, my indifference to God's offer, all my self-righteousness, 
changing my mind from indifference to desire, from self-righteousness to an acknowledgement of sin and need. It means forsaking all my efforts to earn God's gift, to make myself worthy, changing my mind from endless striving to simply receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord of my life. Examination of ourselves is extremely important. Emerson says, it's far more, it is far more to a person's interest that he should see his own faults than that anyone else should see them. And a man's <coughs> thought will convince us that this is true and will make us thankful for the comforter, the Holy Spirit, who reveals them to us. A sure way to look at ourselves is to look in the mirror, isn't it? In the morning, I'm sure most of you look in the mirror. Where to look in the mirror? Into the mirror of God's word. Are we dressed appropriately? And the word tells us this, we are to take off or put aside anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech, and put on a heart of compassion kindness, humility, gentleness and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. This is in Colossians 3. Once we've examined ourselves, let's look at to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and it sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Our self-dependence must come to an end. With some of us, when sorrow, suffering, affliction, broken plans and hopes bring to us to that place of defeat, that's when the Lord can really take hold of our lives. J.B. Stoney has said, it's a great thing to learn faith. That is, Simple dependence on the Lord. And you know, um, what about looking at our past? How do we look at our past? Philippians 3, 13 and 14, we're told, <clears throat> forgetting what is behind and straining for what lies ahead. Sometimes, are you asking, how can I get beyond my past mistakes? <clears throat> and become successful. How can I thrive, as we've been talking about? We need to forgive and let go, whether it's to forgive ourselves or to someone else, or forgiving someone else. And this is a big thing, and this is something that I regularly talk to prisoners about, forgiving themselves. That's the hardest thing to do. Paul could easily have let the memory of the Christians that he had put to death before meeting Christ, that could have destroyed him and robbed him of his destiny. But he refused to do it. Instead he wrote, Dear brothers and sisters, <clears throat> I am not all that I should be, but I'm bringing all energies to bear on this one thing, forgetting the past, I strain to reach to the end of the race and receive the prize for which God is calling us up to heaven because of what Christ has done for us. I don't know if you've heard of Rita Nightingale. You, I'm sure you've heard of Florence Nightingale. But uh, Rita Nightingale had a struggle to forgive. She talks about this in her book, Free for Life. She became a Christian while she was in prison in Thailand on a false charge of smuggling heroin. It would be a terrible thing to be in prison for something you didn't do. She writes, It was a slow and painful progression. Each person had to be prayed over, agonised over, and forgiven. When I thought I had really forgiven somebody, 
I would find myself resenting them two or three days later and have to forgive them all over again. It was only as I looked back as the days became weeks and the weeks months that I saw that my attitudes were changing. I was learning how to forgive. And that's learning to forgive 70 times 7, isn't it, really? When the ugly incident or the person raises its head to forgive them again and again and again. Mark 11, 25, Jesus says this, If you have anything against anyone, forgive them, that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. It's a dangerous thing to pray to the Lord um, if you haven't forgiven, because he may not answer your prayers. And in Luke 9, 62, we read, Anyone who starts ploughing and keeps looking back isn't worthy of, of a, uh, isn't worth a thing to God's kingdom. By looking in the rear vision mirror when we're driving, instead of looking on the road ahead, we'll soon end up in a ditch. So we're to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and the road ahead. And so this leads us to looking to the future. As we look to the future, we must look at it from the Lord's point of view. This is where our imaginations are to be brought into line with the word of God. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, casting down imaginations and bringing into captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ. I love reading books <coughs> written by Isabel Kuhn, K-U-H-N, who was a missionary in China for many years. She worked among the Lisu in the mountains of China. And in her book, In the Arena, she says, a magic imagination can give us a bad time, but I must assert my right to a sound mind. For we read in 2 Timothy, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And then she suggested these points, and I thought they were worth sharing. Point one, refuse to allow your imagination to play with your future. Our future is ordained by God, and no man can guess it. Point two, it's harmful to imagine our later days. Point three, bring all thoughts into line as they, so that they will not dishonour Christ. Point four, be engaged in useful work in the meantime. Serve the Lord. Point five, gather idle ways of God. Those lovely little flowers that grow right up on the mountain tops, even in the snow, where to gather those little flowers, those things of joy, even in challenging experiences, and do not fret. <clears throat> Our daughter keeps a gratitude diary, and at the end of each day, she writes down the things that she is grateful for, and she thanks the Lord. And she said to me, You know, Mum, if tomorrow I didn't have what I didn't thank the Lord for the day before, I'd be up the creek. If I didn't have running water, if I didn't have my vision, if I didn't have my limbs, you know, where would I be? How dependent are we are? How dependent are we on the Lord? In John 14, 3, we have these lovely words from the Lord Jesus. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. What a wonderful hope we have as we look to the future that even at death the Lord will be there and he will take us on to be in heaven. Now finally, looking at all things. And this is extremely important. 
Uh, I think one of my favourite characters in the Bible, apart from the Lord Jesus, is Caleb. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because he saw everything from God's point of view. He always brought God into the situation. He was one of the spies that were sent out by Moses to see the, the land that the Lord had promised. Now ten spies came back and they gave a terrible report about the giants in the land, how difficult it was going to be. But um, Caleb didn't. He said, we can defeat them. You know, because we have the Lord. And uh, the Lord honoured him. And later Moses said he was honoured because he followed the Lord fully. Okay? He saw things consistently from God's point of view. And even at 80, Caleb was able to say, I can still go in and out and fight. You know, isn't that amazing at 80? When I'm 80, I want to be able to go in and out and fight for the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, what a, what a um, something to look forward to. But Miles Stanford, in his book, Principles of Spiritual Growth, says that the open secret of happy or healthy spiritual growth is to know and settle down upon this fact as set out in Romans 8, 28 and 29. We know that to those who love God, who are called according to his plan, everything that happens fits into a pattern for good, for God in his foreknowledge chose them to bear the family likeness of his son that he might be the eldest of a family. So you know God is using everything that comes into our lives to change us, to mould us so that we will be more like Jesus. When we see that all things are working together to make us more and more like the Lord, we will not be so frustrated and upset when some of these things are hard and difficult to understand and often contain an element of death where the Lord wants us to let go of our expectations. If we pamper and live for ourselves, we become more and more self-centred. But when we look into the Lord Jesus, we become more and more like him. There were certain Greeks who said to the Apostle Philip, Sir, we want to see Jesus. And as we look to the Lord, God is working in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. Now Ruth Johnson was a poetess and this is what she wrote. Lord, I vaguely discern as trees walking. I need your touch to focus clarify, restore. With my weak eyesight, the overwhelming task of tomorrow paralyse my effectiveness today. Those what-ifs of the future rob me of present joy. So Lord, I'm trusting you for your wholeness of vision in my outlook until the dark glass gives place to heaven's perfect perception. May we see the way the Lord wants us to see. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. May the Lord give us